Good, good, all good. So welcome everybody. Welcome to Global Azure Days 2022. Would you believe we're actually back in person? Yes, yes. So hello everyone. I'm John Baliris. I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. I've actually been a member of this user group since 2012, roughly the same time as Simon. Um, but now that, well, we basically are out of COVID, uh, I thought it would be good for me to actually give back something to the community that I kept getting info from. So um, I'm here to present, that's my um, gift back to everybody. But unfortunately in a very, very short 30 minutes, I'm gonna go through an awesome integration journey with you. Um, but I will make a small call out to a sister user group, uh, Integration Down Under, um, run by Dan, is he in the audience? Bill as well, yes. Uh, which, we, which they specifically talk about integration topics. So if it's just Azure you're interested in, that's you know, fantastic. Everything Azure is covered here. But specific to integration is also the other group. So there's plenty of meetups, not just here. So I encourage everyone to join them. Um, I've got a lot of info to cover because I normally do cover a lot and I love talking, even to my customers. Um, I always overrun in my meetings. So please, I'm going to be presenting. There'll be a whole bunch of nuggets on the screens, but I won't be saying out verbatim. So pay attention to the screen as well, not just my pretty face. <laughs> I hope you got your morning coffee. Uh, I definitely got it. And last thing, I'll be here all day. If I don't get time for any Q&A, please feel free to come in and approach me directly. So let's get started. Moving on to the next slide. Oh, there's our integration down under. Good. Okay. Um, one common question I get asked is why and what is driving integration? So obviously there's three pillars that drive us. So one is modernization around the integration. So we do see enterprises increasingly using modern apps. You know, dare I say, every one of us has got a modern phone, not an old brick. So what's happening is everyone's having an appetite to change because there is a change in the underlying tech, which means the tech for integration has to change. And that also brings around, um, you know, businesses going faster forward. The other part is cloud adoption. You know, of again, digital transformation, phones are a classic example to meet customer demands, basically meet the customer where they are and us as customers of other, say, retailers, for example, they're making it easier for us to engage with them. So by that digital transformation they're going through, behind the scenes there needs to be a robust set of integration tools and hence uh, that's a key driver to integration. And last one is productivity. Uh, we're all developers at heart. We like to write lots and lots of lines of code, but if there's ways and shortcuts you can take, um, you know, why not take advantage of them and therefore be more productive and of course the, the term faster to market, you know, reduce the time to market. So what is integration services? It comprises of this, set of services going through, um, as we got there, it's a bit small on this screen, better on that screen, logic apps. So obviously going through and being able to create little service workflows to actually do that orchestration of other APIs or other backend systems as well. Serverless compute with functions. So um, dare I say, everyone knows what an Azure function is, um, it's part as well as the extended family of our integration services. APIM or a application, uh, API management is the basically the facade for all the APIs we create. So if you're an app dev and you're creating the mobile front end of something, all the APIs for the back end are gonna be faced out to a customer through um, application uh, API management. Um, the beauty about that is that you can get to monitor who's using it, put on a whole bunch of policies to make sure it's up and running uh, within some governance framework. So the classic one being throttling. The other as well as there is event grid and service bus. They come under messaging and, and eventing. There's a difference between events and messages, which I won't get into, but the eventing 
backplane is Event Grid. You can use Event Hub as well, and Service Bus, which is a messaging part. And um, there are differences. There are subtle differences, and there are obvious differences. But obviously, come and ask me if, later if you want to know more about it. So the beauty about all these put together, they are actually in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, and they've been in there for quite a few years. So if anyone's you know, working with an enterprise organization that asks, you know, you know, how is Microsoft's services compared to others, um, just be prepared to pull out the Magic Quadrant. It's available on our um, website and actually show them that it actually is up there and robust. Another small call out is this one in the corner. The whole bunch of application services now are ARC enabled, which means they can manage them and deploy to them no matter where they are. They can be running in Azure, obviously, that's the best place to run it, but they can be in AWS, competitor clouds, or even on-prem. So you can actually run and deploy wherever you like. Now, why, why use Azure integration services? So basically, four key reasons. Innovation, so obviously, you know, there is a whole bunch of services put together. So best way to put it, it's a suite of services. APIM, Logic Apps, Event Grid, Service Bus, and there's more, and put them all together, it's one best in class collection of things you can use. You get the single pane of glass being the Azure portal, but underlying all those as well is the experience from a performance perspective and the SLAs you can provide. So obviously with um, APIM, uh, last time we checked, we got a, um, a 12 and a half million API calls daily with that SLA for your instance. So that's a pretty large um, uh, volume. And we also got growth on growth and how many people. So actually it's got a big market adoption. So it's, it's not just a little boutique um, platform. Obviously, every company wants to talk about security compliance. Um, it's a very uh, timely topic. Microsoft spends about a billion dollars a year on cybersecurity research, and that kind of investment also goes into every service, not just protecting the platform, but secure coding practices at the onset of the platform. So it is um, protected by, basically from the foundations up, is the best way to put it. And obviously um, the offers, uh, couldn't think of a better word, but um, what you can get out of the platform. So. Azure Logic Apps, for example, has a whole bunch of free actions you can use for your consumption plan. And um, not, in the, not quite put in there, but the other thing as well is um, Logic Apps provides 450 or so connectors available, so you don't actually have to write your REST call in code to call an external API. It's just a drag and drop. So it um, makes your productivity much, much faster. And, and obviously, from my perspective, I'm telling you, it's better. Okay. So, going in a bit more into the depths of these services, we have Azure Logic Apps. So, they're there to help you create and run automated workflows to integrate your apps, your data, and other services, even external services, at B2B, scenarios, internal scenarios, and it makes it simpler to connect to even to legacy systems. If they can, if it's just a on-prem DB SQL server, you can still connect to it via a logic app. So a couple of examples, um, scheduling email notifications about something, you know, um, for example, a, a pay run has been completed. Um, routing customer orders, a classic example, which I used to do many, many years for BizTalk. Order comes in, it needs to be fulfilled um, because there's a fulfillment area that actually packs it and sends it out. And once it's finished and then the second half of the process has got to start, that's a very common scenario. FTP, another common scenario for integration. FTP has an out-of-the-box connector for uh, available for use in Azure Logic Apps. 
and um, well, the, there is no Logic Apps demo without Twitter. So, um, uh, so hence why um, my demo will be a, a classic Twitter integration. So that's the most common one. So, um, and of course, a couple of nuggets there. I get asked this quite often. Functions or logic apps. So um, the choice is yours. Don't panic. And you have to make a hard decision. There is no right decision. Analyze what you are doing. There's a couple of small nuggets of rules. If they are useful to you, um, look at it that way and try figuring out. But there is no um, hard or, or fast rule. Next slide, okay, APIM or API management. So it is a hybrid multi-cloud platform, which does mean it can run elsewhere. Um, it's uh, available for you to run on-prem as well if you needed to, or in another uh, provider. And it provides you the ability to package your APIs abstract what you've got in the back end to different front ends. So that's a classic example that um, I teach to some of um, people is you might have a different set of APIs inside your back end systems on prem, but you want to expose them under one common FQDN and make your own different paths and really you can do protocol adaption from rest to soap as well. So if you've got old soap services, yes, companies still do have them. You can do that as well. So you're basically giving time for the back end people to modernize while you've already got a modern front end for your consumers to actually use it. And obviously, security, uh, dare I say, every security is in there, but also the ability to observe how the API is working. So you can actually integrate APIM with App Insights to actually see the telemetry of usage how long each part of the path of that API call takes, important. And they've, and obviously, um, expose your APIs to the world. There are people who like to borrow other people's APIs to come up with an app, and there's lots of examples. So if you are in a company that likes to do that, to API is the way to do it and securely and uh, through some protection mechanisms such as rate policies and subscription keys, so you only allow who is getting access to what. Service bus. Okay, so service bus um, is a messaging platform. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of great benefits and a couple of nuggets up there that I put. The most important one I see it is load balancing work across consuming competitors, um, but also just load leveling. Uh, there's a lot of examples that I come across that back-end systems are already loaded and by exposing it out to another API, for example, into the public, it's going to cause too much traffic for the back-end and it's going to crash. So the way to do it is you put a queue, a service bus queue in the middle. So it will be accepting the information coming in, let's say it's an order, and there'll be a consumer of that message but running at a certain rate. So that way that load leveling protects the back end because it's the one doing the throttling. And that and also allows you to have guaranteed delivery. And that's an important concept in integration. Um, what types of delivery mechanisms you know, at once, at most once, at least once. There's some of the concepts that come in. But it, it's the mechanism to provide it. So the best way I describe service bus is it's the Swiss Army knife for messaging driven workloads. So Keep that in mind. If you're looking at that kind of pattern, use Service Bus. The other one is Event Grid. Um, it's different because events are supposed to be notifications of, or a, this way, a notification of something has happened. You know, the classic example, and uh, you would probably know this one, an IoT temperature sensor when it's sending its telemetry, the current temperature is this, the current temperature is this, so that's the event. It's small, it's discrete, and there's lots of them. We're talking about millions of them. So this is where Event Grid comes into its, um, into its you know, world of being. 
Okay? These discrete events raised by all these IoT sensors come in to here and you can pub sub them out. So it's quite important if you might have the, the temperature sensor uh, going and controlling an automated uh, setting, but there might be sent off to somewhere else. And an example that um, is used quite often is it goes into some kind of streaming backend, such as stream analytics, and it does an analysis over that data for a sliding window of, let's say, 10 minutes. So if the temperature exceeds, let's say, 28 degrees for 10 minutes, then it starts to say, hang on, there might be something wrong with the sensor or something's happened in that room. Should I, then you can take that event and say, okay, I've got to send the, uh, the security guard there to do a, a quick check. So that's where it comes into it. But it's based on event-driven type scenarios. And it's made for, obviously, high availability and, obviously, big scale. So it's, um, it's made for that kind of scenario. Now, there are common patterns that we see in integration, and there's four of them, and I'll go through them quickly. Um, just leave as much time as I can for the demo. And the first one, and most obviously one, is just application integration, getting information between different data repositories and putting it together and what it looks like. So you will normally start as your business with a set of data repositories. There's disparate data, but you need to move it around. You can move it around either through data factory at big volumes, so I think the SSIS in the cloud, or if you're looking at discrete messages from your API gateway and getting that information in, then you start looking at logic apps or Service, uh, serverless functions to actually put this all through together. So multiple systems, doesn't matter if it's SAP or SQL, you grab that data and you integrate it. So the beauty about this as well is um, you're able to use what you've existing got at the back end already. And with the Logic App connectors, there's, um, as I said, there's about 450 plus of them, it makes it easier. And that's one of the options about choosing Logic Apps or Functions. So keep that in mind. If you can find a connector for Logic Apps and it makes sense, instead of having to build some kind of code that will do that um, data service for you, um, yeah, take advantage of them. Obviously, integrating people, systems, and services. So um, it doesn't make sense to just do data movement or anything without it actually meaning something to someone like us, as in the consumer and consumer. So um, the whole pattern here is to make sure that it's available for others to consume. So whether it's client apps, and I've got here uh, the classic scenario of the Power Apps or Power Automate, which is the um, workflow engine behind there. So you can actually allow your organization to use your own APIs but these are internal apps. So you see a lot of them. There's a classic use case available, how Heathrow Airport reduced the number of paper printouts that needed to be done for security checks around just because the security guard himself took it onto himself to learn how to do power apps. And he wrote a very small power app with help of the dev team and everything now the security audits is all done by that little power app. So keep that in mind because as the developers, we'll be doing all the back end work to make this happen, but the end people being our customers and us as well are the ones that need to take advantage of it. Of course, real time applications goes without saying we've got our phones, we've got, we're working at web speed, we all need dare I say immediacy is the word that um, I use against my kids, stop being so immediate. You know, you're asking for something, think about what you're asking, what it means, because that way you understand, don't expect the immediate response. But unfortunately, as apps developers, we're doing all the backend stuff and our apps at the front 
that are being used by our customers really need to have real-time integration. So it means we need to build the apps to be fast. We need to get some telemetry out of it so we know how they're being used. We also need to be innovative, but that means being able to work really quickly and therefore being productive. And if we're using tools that are already, already available, makes it much easier for us to react to changes in the business as they see how those apps are being used. But also at a technical thing, uh, back end, if we are looking at big uh, uh, thing like an event grid, we're able to react to whatever's happening very quickly. So if we need to look at that type of scenario, um, you'll be choosing event grid over the other ones. And last but not least, and I could see Dan smiling because, yes, I've been around BizTalk as well for many, many years, and people are still asking, is BizTalk still running? And the answer is yes, it's still, and there's a new version out. Uh, will it still be supported? Yes, for another 10 years, but people are asking, do I still need to run BizTalk? Well, the answer is no, you don't need to, you can but you can also migrate. So it's a common scenario. BizTalk has been around since, what, 2020? Uh, I'm sorry, 20, 2000, sorry. So it's 2022, so 22 years. Ooh, okay, so <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> 22 years. So um, people are saying, okay, can I modernize that? And that's one of the drivers that I said at the, at the earlier set of the session. Can I modernize it? And there is, yes, there's a migrator tool that is available to actually read your BizTalk MSI and produce a set of artifacts that are Azure Cloud. So basically, as you can see, it's a plug-in architecture, so it does the same thing as BizTalk does by its abstractions of what comes in, what's the workflow, where's the destination. So if you remember BizTalk, receive ports, send ports, then you've got the orchestration itself. So it does the same kind of thing, but then uh, people have been asking this. So keep that in mind if you do come across your, in your own companies or um, your customers that people are looking at modernization of BizTalk or any integration platform. Um, BizTalk, look at the Migrator tool. Yeah. And now, I'm hopefully, how am I going for time? Oh, 10 minutes. Oh, that's perfect. Perfect. Now. Awesome demo time. There is no, there is no integration demo without Twitter in the way. And that was actually a tweet yesterday. I saw yes, someone said that, and I'm going to be guilty of that. So, the scenario is Joe. That's not his real name. He's presenting at Contoso's annual tech fest, <laughs> and wants to capture audience sentiment from Twitter. Store it for analysis and receive a summary every minute to his mobile. So that's, I won't say who Joe is, but that's uh, what's happening. So there's people in the audience, this Sam, Simon, Aaron, and everyone else in the audience. They're using the event, which our Twitter hashtag is Global Azure Sydney. And if you add on hashtag integration is awesome, I'll be seeing it. Sends all that in, and there's a logic app. It's calling out a function to grab all that information, as you can see, and I'll go through it slowly on the screen here, if I can, let me yeah, pen, let's highlight it so everyone can see. And it goes out to cognitive services through a connector, so I didn't have to write any code, just through a connector, to find out the sentiment of the tweet text. Takes it back and stores it in Cosmos DB. So I'm capturing what's happening in the world. I haven't started any of the logic apps or anything, so don't tweet yet, because I'm not capturing. I'm just going to go through the scenario first. And then that information is sent to an Azure function. Um, that's done through what's called a change feed processor. Okay, so when data goes into Cosmos DB, you have the ability to actually listen to it. Okay, so you can do something else. And that's a very common pattern, and this is what I'm using, called the materialized view pattern. So if I need to summarize things, I don't want to rely on Cosmos DB queries grouped by and everything. I can actually get that information via this pattern, 
and then summarize it back. So this is the implementation of the pattern. So every time a tweet is stored in Cosmos DB's container, it is sent to an Azure function to process, and it puts that tweet sentiment in a service bus queue. Then I have another function, it could be a logic app, I just chose function, to get that message and then increment the counter that I have for the sentiment back in Cosmos DB. So I've got a separate container for that sentiment summary or what's called a materialized view. And then in the last part at the bottom, there's a logic app which just goes and reads every minute what's happening in Cosmos DB and then calls out the Twilio API. Again, that's a connector, so I didn't have to write any code. It's a connector into Twilio, and then it's going to send me a message to my mobile to let me know the sentiment at that point in time. So, okay, let's. Okay, let's uh, bring over the. the oh, this way. Okay. Hope everyone can see that. It's a bit too big. If you don't mind me making it a little smaller to see, just let me know. Does that look okay? Don't need the bookmarks. Okay, so in my resource group, I've got a whole bunch of stuff. So the important one, obviously, the logic app. So in the logic app, it has two workflows. The get Twitter feed, which is the one that controls going up, and then the one that sends me the sentiment analysis. Now, quickly, so I can go in and get it started. You can see I've got it disabled. But in the designer, and this is what the beauty of Logic Apps being a lower code part of the platform, is I have a drag and drop surface. And if I need to do anything, and I've been playing with this and putting all these really nice things in there to show you that I can, as you can see, the first one, call Azure function for tweets. I'm from a logic app directly calling an Azure function. I can get the JSON and parse it so I can actually play with it in a proper schema. I've put a terminate one in there, so if, you know, which, you know, if you're looking at more difficult integrations, if we come to a particular point in integration flow and it's finished, you can just say terminate. I'm finished, I'm done. So I've just shown you that the whole range of them. You can actually put in variables as well. So I've got a variable in there as well. So you can actually have it, but you think abstractly, you've got codes and you just use all these connectors. But importantly for us, let's get this one started. I've been doing my demo here with hashtag Microsoft, but we're gonna do uh, integration. So global Azure SID me. And the next one is hashtag integration Oops, if I can spell it, would be nice, is awesome. Okay. And save it. Saving the workflow. Saved. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to enable it. So that's going to kick off the, the first part of it. So it's going to be listening now and go getting it. As you can see, the run history of me playing with this last night just to make sure everything was okay is still here. You get the run history by default for 30 days. So if you've got any audit requirements, it's built in out of the box. And you can also put it out into App Insights, which I will show you um, as it's going. So we'll just let it run. And what I will do is I'll also get the send one to enable that one as well. So that way the logic apps are running and they'll be up and running. So. So let's continue what else is happening. I have the Azure function. I've got three functions, as you saw, one that called out to get the, f the actual Twitter feed. And there is a reason, and I do have a whole bunch of stickers I'll throw at people if anyone can figure out why I did that as a function. No? Okay. No, it's okay. And I have the sentiment summary, which is the back part that puts it into here. And I'll show you the code, and I'll... So that one will get a good swag if anyone could tell me why I did it that way. Just go to files. Okay. 
happen. So I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's highlighted in squiggy, in squiggy thing here. Hopefully it's coming through. Oh, two people at the same time. Oh, okay. <laughs> why would I do that there? Not, not, not what I did the service bus, but what's the significance of filling those values in there? Okay. Waiting for you. you can go. Who's going first? He can. Go, go. My question is actually close to that, but I don't think the focus. But which uh, cross multiplication database type API did you choose? Uh, SQL Core or Google? Or S SQL. I choose okay. SQL. Mm -hmm. Okay, so didn't answer yet. Go. You're explicitly trying to serialize them? Correct. Yeah. I'm doing it. And you get good swag, so here you go. Here's one. <laughs> Okay. You come and get the, the socks afterwards deliberately. Why do I do it deliberately? Because every time there's a sentiment, I'm keeping a summary. If I have two people writing to the same summary at the same time, I can get changes, conflicts. So I either serialize it or handle the conflict with a retry. So that's the approach. So keep that in mind because I want the summary to be true summary. That's one of the things. So there's, okay, so beauty about writing code. So I showed you, you can use the Logic App Designer inside the Azure portal. You can write code in Visual Studio for the function. But, and here's the other beauty, oh, sorry, my mouse is just, there it is. You can actually write the Logic Apps inside here. There it is down there. Oops, I'll go right click, open in Designer. I'll close that. And when it decides to open a designer, you'll see the same design surface that you, I had in the Azure portal inside Visual Studio Code. Beauty about that is you can put it all into a Git repo. There it is. Took a while. Put it all into Git repo. So your code is code. So if anyone works in an org that says, I don't like you using the Azure portal because the software code, the definition is not in Git or other repo that you use, Keep that in mind. You can actually do that. They're just JSON files. Okay. Cosmos DB. Obviously, answer to your question. It's a SQL API. It's serverless. So um, I'm only paying um, for what I'm using. Uh, so let's see if there's any items that have come in yet. Oh, yes. People are coming through. So you can see people are tweeting there. Um, I won't show because it might show people's, I don't have, I've only got author ID, so I don't have no names, I've just got the text, so you'll see people coming through. So what happens is all this is being stored in here, and if we go back to the presentation, some, uh, it's gone onto the other screen. So it's gone all the way around, it's in the service bus queue, and the beauty about this, and this is why I've got this tab open, if we do a... Scroll the mouse a bit. There you can see the requests coming in. So the telemetry is all here for everyone else to see. And the beauty about app insights as well is it's got failures. So if something is going wrong, you'll start seeing failures. It's the first one, which is what all the ops team love to see. Something's not going right. Dear Dev, go have a look. And you can just go into the Azure portal and actually look at it, and you get all that telemetry. So, um, so we've got. I don't want smart decisions so the app, app map. So it's building up the app map. Hopefully it's got enough in there. And you can see how it's all working. Uh, so this is beautiful. This is just built in to the Azure portal as part of uh, um, the... Uh, and have I got texts? Yes, I've got five texts already. This is fantastic. So I have the latest text saying that Six positive and no negative and no neutral sentiments. Fantastic. So I'm doing a good job. So as the presenter, I'm, I'm seeing these messages. And I'm meeting my scenario that, um, you know, I'll put it back on the screen. Oh, it's done this. I'll swap the presentation view. So I'm meeting my scenario that you know, I'm getting all this information all the way around through. And Twilio is sending me messages on a minute basis saying, thing, saying I'm doing a good job. So think of this as a better, you know, in a bigger event where lots and lots of people, you might want to do this. 
bunch of hashtags and that's all it needs to do and comes through. Now this is you know, the classic scenario. I've always done a logic app with Twitter. It just happens to be a nice social interaction bit of a game, gets people excited. Now also, there are many other use cases for logic apps. Hopefully I've given you some part of what is available. So please take advantage of the platform features that are available in logic apps at all and all the integration services and put all together a solution. So that concludes my um, session. Um, hopefully I am on time, right on time. So any Q and A, yes, go for it. First of all, really interesting. So the question is, um, how long did it actually take to come up with this demo? And the other part was, which parts, was it? Yeah, yeah which part? So time to, to, time to spend and water. So which part, how long did it take to do? I started this on Tuesday. Okay? I had it ready yesterday, uh, but then I had to unfortunately redo it because my Azure subscription ran out because I'm using my personal subscription. So I had to redo it last night. So it took since Tuesday on and off, obviously, in between there I was working. So this is in my personal time. Now, in terms of the architecture, I did make a mistake and I was looking at some of the connectors and that was, it's one of the gotchas and that's why there's a function that happens to be here. That function normally wouldn't be there except for this scenario. I'm looking for tweets every minute. The connector that is available for Azure, for Logic App Standard, only polls every hour. Okay, so that's one other thing is, as an architect when you're trying to design these, come up with an integration and then at the Logic App level, look at the connector info. Find out if the connector suits. So I started that process, then I had to say it didn't work. So how else could I do it? I had to introduce the, the function. Because the function I can control, I can invocate whenever I like. So that was one of the hard parts of the architecture. So 